Hello everybody and welcome to part four, I believe, of Minecraft Musings for Memorial Day weekend, day three. So anyways, and there was really only a day one and day two because I had my kiddos in between, which was awesome. But um, anyways, I uh, just got done doing more editing. I got ready for signing up to Code Wars with my ARI social media account, which is the email you'll find on my YouTube. So again, if you have any questions for computer science, feel free to send me an email on that. I do check that occasionally. I mean, that's the caveat is like, there's no guaranteed wait time. Like I can't guarantee I will answer your question in a timely manner. However, I can pretty much tell you that like if I start getting a bunch of coding questions, although I'd probably want to do them like on air or like recorded because then it benefits everybody. But like you could send me questions, we could work it out and then I could say it on air or something. Or, you know, it's even easier to just comment in the YouTube videos and be like, hey, I want to know about this or could you explain this a little better? And honestly, if it's something I have no idea about, we'll still take a look like. Um, but again, the time, the time delay thing. So. And hopefully, like, I'm trying to set it up to where, or trying to keep in mind everything I can think of to where you won't really need a lot of, like, hand-holding, per se. And not that that's a bad thing. Like, I mean, we all feel a little more comfortable when we're trying to learn something new if we have, like, like a buddy system or, um, uh, yeah, so, like, that's why in school, like, pu or public school, where you have to be there, it's a little easier to be like, oh, okay, we're going to go through this and this and that, so... Um, anyway, pretty vague and I digress, but <clears throat> happy to say that we are set up to do the Code Wars recording. I see where to do a stream and I don't want to do a stream because then like with my internet and everything and I'm not trying to run a hard line. So with, with current setup and everything, I think it's best if I do a, a recording and just go through a bunch of Code Wars challenges and just explain how I would think to solve them. And that way, and then like I'll open it up to questions like, and think of it as just like a lecture. Like if you're going to computer science class, like this is how you program in Python. And that's all we're going to do. And that's why I wanted to do this uh, Minecraft Musings as a kind of prep for that. So we're going to talk Python. And actually, while I think about that, we are going to set the 30 minute limit because I want this to be only 30 minutes. And you can already skip to two and a half minutes. There you go. Or whatever. Um, for when to set the alarm. Let's see, so it's about three minutes, so, and it is, jeez. So it's going to be three, <laughs> 18 minutes. <laughs> 38 minutes. Yeah, I'm just... 33 minutes. Okay, actually, you know what? 33 minutes. That, that's good. That's a good round. Um, and actually, that's 33 minutes from now. So it'll be a 36-minute video. There we go. <clears throat> Anyways, so this is to prepare you for Python programming. Now, what we're going to try to do is log in. And I'm just going to start fresh. I'm going to show you, like, I, I entered my email. I created a password. Um, and that's all. That's as far as I'm at right now. So, um, and anyways, yeah, we're, I'm just going to show you what it's like to do Code Wars. And so some basic concepts of programming are, first, it's just like reading um, English language. Uh, top down, left to right is how code is, ri is read by computers. Even though, I mean, they take out all the weight space, and we won't worry about that. But that's why, I like, in certain programming languages, semicolons are important, whereas in Python, uh, tabs and indent spacing are important. So that's how you tell the computer, okay, this is piece of code belongs with this area, and this is a separate piece of code. So, and just as long as you know that it changes from language to language, you'll be in good shape. So, and then you need to understand variables are like containers or boxes that hold a value. <coughs> Like if you were to have like a, like anyone who's played Battleship, you know, if I had like an A1, this is my emeralds, that at location A1, it contains 
64 of type emerald. So, and then this would be 64 of type melon, and then four of type pumpkin at you know this different grid space. And it's actually really close to accurate to how computer architecture is set up. I mean, you really want to think about it as like a ladder. Every memory address has an exact address, just like every port has an exact port when you're getting into like the networking and uh, security side. So, anyways, um, but back to Python. So you have a variable. Um, and Python is very forgiving. It doesn't care if it's an integer or a float or um, anything like that. Uh, like other languages like Java tend to have an issue with that. So, but with Python, you just declare a variable. You say like my underscore variable, and you got to use snake case, which is like all lowercase letters and underscores between the words. That's the the polite way or the proper way to write Python. But you can write it. Um, you can name your variables camel case if you're a Java developer, but usually that indicates Java code, and it's kind of cringe to write in snake case for Java and vice versa, writing in camel case for... And camel case is where you capitalize the first letter of every word, and there's even two camps of that where you can either capitalize the very first letter, um, so the very first word, and then I don't. I leave it like... Well, actually, I don't and I do, because even as I say that, I believe I signed up as A-Rai with a capital A, whereas I've also done A-Rai with a lowercase a. So even with dashes as a delimiter. And real quick, a delimiter is something that separates something. So it could be dots usually, um, dots, dashes, or underscores, or just capital letters are delimiters, I guess, in the camel case sense. So anyway, so there's a little brief history of that. And then once you understand variables, then you can start doing things. Like you could say like my variable one or my one var equals five, and my var two equals six, and then you do my sum equals my var plus my var, my var one plus my var two. is a very complicated and roundabout way of just getting an addition function. But then you could see and prove that, okay, so when you add the two variables together, we get this. And that's important because you might not know where your variable's coming from in the future. Like you have it set here as a test case, you set it to five and six or whatever it was, like, see, and I don't even remember, and I don't even care, because it, it doesn't matter. You're going to want to test it with a few different values. Like, try a negative number, see what happens. Or try, like, a really, really large number, see what happens. Because if it crashes your code, then you need to account for that, or you need to take precautions. So, and that's usually a try-catch block. I want to say it's the same in Python, but... The Python coding that we're going to go over, it doesn't get as deep as that. Um, it doesn't go into like objects creating and like different files. It's going to be um, basically like scripting. Like we're going to be doing little tips and tricks on like formatting output, um, stylizing output. Let's see. And calculating things. Oh. So, anyways, yeah. And the other thing is like, so if you're doing bash programming, which is another very necessary skill for a career in tech. Um, you can, it's called piping. So you can just do the pipe, which is the vertical line, after a command, and it takes the output of that command and feeds it as input into the new command. And each command can be thought of as a tool ooh, or a process or a utility. And so that's why I, we'll do some Linux programming. In fact, I have an old video. Um, so back when I was still learning how to stream and how to record and everything. And this is going to be a trial testing thing too, because this will be the first thing. I'm going to record it with OBS, hopefully. But I want to do an offline copy, so then it's not like live streaming. Which I could do live streaming of this stuff, and I, I really want to kind of get into that eventually. But first I want to build up like the base educational materials, and then we'll go from there. And then we'll like open it up to questions, because honestly, you might try it and find that like... You might not have any questions. It might just be as self-explanatory as possible, and that is by design. Like that's why I try to like the Python coding game tutorial, and I'll put that link in this description. That's how you can actually, on your own time, play around with Python code without having to worry about the headache of a development environment. And see, that's like the biggest um, hurdle I would say when I was learning at CSU. And by all means, I still encourage like go get a degree, do the college experience, like. You know, or at least go take a, a semester somewhere <laughs> or, um, you know, do a boot camp or something. Yeah, the cybersecurity boot camp even with CSU. Yeah, 10 grand, the most you'll pay. Um, and you can get discounts, I think, especially for veterans. I'm not a veteran. I was a CSU student, so I got a discount for already having a degree. And there's that right there. So if you are a CSU graduate, a CSU alum, 
you know, check out their boot camp programs because I'll, I'll tell you what, cybersecurity is the most interesting thing to me. Um, and they're possibly going to need behavioral cybersecurity psychologists, like, you know, crossover degrees, hybrid degrees. Like, mine's technically a business computer science degree. I mean, with a focus on business administration, international business. Like, yeah, so that's good stuff. Wait, actually, is this? No, this isn't even a good idea. Never mind. We're going to go back and get more. We've got a lot of diamond or emeralds. That means that just tells me that we've probably tapped out most of the market to where it'd be enjoyable to do. And we're talking Python. So, anyways, um, now what happens when you have a group of variables? Well, we would call that a list. And now to do a list, um, you do the square brackets. And I know that there's this person I was talking to on Twitter calls them all these different things, but I'm going to call them curly brackets, square brackets, and parentheses. And I will show you examples of all of that. And that's just how I know it. If you want to learn it another way, that's fine. But I mean, you know, if you want to teach it another way. And again, I encourage everybody to make their own and comment a link to your YouTube if you make a video of such a thing. Because I want to see it. And especially if you do it in another language. That would be oh, so awesome. Like right away, I know I could use Spanish because I am a lot more likely to interact with people that speak Spanish and I want to teach them programming than any other language. But all of the languages are definitely welcome. You know, and serve your community, too. Bring some of this, like make one for... Anyways, I digress. So Python lists and dictionaries. Now, dictionaries are um, groups of tuples, and tuples are variables that have two var values, or two variables. And so, and the tuples are denoted with a parenthesis and a comma between the two uh, values. And you know, we'll get into that. And th there's an example on that coding game tutorial under the the ROT13 example algorithms tab. And basically I have dictionaries for encoding or encrypting a message and then dictionaries for decrypting the message. And it is just as simple as a decoder ring. And when you align the encode and decode correctly or the encrypt and decrypt correctly, you will see how the computer program is able to pull values from the dictionaries and then based on what it sees, it pulls the second value or the tuple, the second part of the tuple, um, and they're also known as key value pairs. Sorry, we should say it that way too. So the key value pairs is you get a key to a dictionary, then that's like the index or that's the number of or the address of. See, all of these things are the same. And, then we, and computer science reuses this concept a few times. So like in memory, we can see it. Um, in this, so anyways, I digress. So we'll start off easy, don't worry. We'll talk about just creating variables, printing variables. Like the first program anyone should learn in programming or usually learns is hello world. And the only function of that program is to print out to the screen or to the terminal window, hello world. So that means that your computer is running correctly or your program is running correctly. There is output that you can see and you know that your inv your development environment is set up correctly or configured correctly. And again, that is one of the hardest parts about learning computer science. And that's why I love coding games so much, because it's like, oh, well, just go to this website and you can write code and play with it. Whereas, you know, traditional coding education, including my own, required that you go to a computer lab, at least until you learn enough to remote log in. Or, and, the, and even that, like SSHing into a Linux machine, like, yeah. Well, I mean, it's basically like logging into a website through a terminal instead of a web browser. Like, but I don't know. It was just, it seems so foreign when you're not used to doing it. So, and also, also, I mean, I often went to the computer lab to do it. But anyway, so the coding game tutorial, it explains every concept. Um, so first there's variables and then there's, or well, printing to the screen, then variables, then comments, which are where you can make pieces of code not read by the computer, only read by the people reading your code. So you can start like talking or you can label things like, or you can explain when you're debugging like, you know, it crashes here or this is the last part I see output, you know, stuff like that. And you can also use comments to comment out some of your code so that you think is having the problem. So you can isolate the problem and see, yep, it's right here. It breaks when this code is not commented out. So. Yeah, and really important parts. But again, like these things, we're, we're going on, yeah, 14 minutes, and we've already covered like <laughs> the basic concepts that are um, 
I don't know, entry level jobs require you to understand basically like data structures, algorithms, how to write clean code, how to debug, and how to make it scalable. Is really, are, those are really the main concepts. And then, you know, we have really in depth classes with lots of programs and lots of like hand holding and back and forth. When you go to university, that teaches you, and you have lab hours too, so then you have TAs that you can talk to, and all of this help is what you're really paying for. And I still say it should be nonprofit, don't get me wrong, but it's still worth, like, it's a value, and it adds value to your, your skills. So that's my soapbox for that, and also my justification too. So I will teach you all of this coding and stuff, but you should still take some classes or at least a boot camp to kind of just get the whole... And also the class cohort kind of feel too, working as a team. Because that was one thing about my cyber boot camp was like, we worked together. I mean, we did projects and we collaborated and we spoke with like, like-minded people that were you know, passionate about security. And really that's everybody. I mean, we were passionate, passionate about making money too. But that is in the White Hat Manifesto that we do these things not for financial gain, but for the security and prosperity of the global community. So, and that's actually, so global community, that's my own little caveat because, you know, it's really like I do these things for good, not evil, is the basis of the White Hat Manifesto. But I say for the global community because even just saying that and having that mindset, that's the Star Trek mindset. Like, live long and prosper. Like, you know, health, security, safety, prosperity. Like, these things that were originally considered super nerdy because it was so hard to, like, get into that. Like, you know, you had to watch the show and be a fan and all of that. I don't know. So... But now it's super easy. We're in the middle of a coding video, and we're just talking about human ethics worldwide. And that is the basis of uh, preventative blue team and behavioral cybersecurity. So anyways, Python. So what we're going to do is we're going to be making a bunch of lists, I can already tell you. And we have these other tool utilities, these commands that we can call um, on variables, and we can either make them uppercase or lowercase. So like now we've introduced printing to the screen, but now we can talk about formatting. So we can do like upper or two upper or two lower. Like I don't even remember. I'd, I'd probably have to look it up. Uh, I'm going to try a couple of things. And uh, mind you, this is also Java, JavaScript, like all the different languages that I've learned mashed all together as I have only used a little bit of Python and the little bit of Python I did. Um, it was just, it was manipulating text. And it was also keying off of input text. Um, it was a Discord bot, basically, and I watched a video to build the basics of it and how to link it to a Discord channel, and then I proceeded to code, okay, well, if it calls this command, roll, then I, well, and that was actually in the video to return a random number, then what I was doing is, like, if it did a, um, a certain phrase or word, it would key off of that and say, print out, and I did a table flip, so it'd be like, you know, it's a funny emoji that you can find on the internet, and, uh, it's where it just looks like this little stick figure is flipping a table. So, and th these are just cheeky, fun things to do. Of course, they could be very malicious and you know dangerous things you, that you do. So you got to be careful. But um, at least for this stuff, like, and that's the other cool thing about Code and Game, and Code Wars too. These are both. Um, sorry, I keep saying Code and Game, just because that's where my tutorial is, and we'll be, like, I mean, I'll have it pulled up so I can actually show you in real time a different test environment, but Code Wars has a test environment themselves. It's just a little um, trickier to get used to, I feel like. Because at least with the coding game, I don't know, they're both a little tricky. I mean, and everything has a learning curve because you need to be able to accomplish a few certain things no matter where you're trying to run your code. So, um, anyways, yeah, let's see, we're at 18 minutes. All right, what else can we talk about? So we're going to use dictionaries and lists to uh, store data, manipulate data, and output data. We're going to calculate things. We're going to, that's being very vague, and I'm trying to remember some of the actual white challenges that I've done before. Those are the easier ones. Um, basically, like, output this variable all to uppercase, or, um, like, you got all these measurements, and they, they just feed you a bunch, and then, and I'm also kind of mixing up code, code in game, too. And I should do some of that recording on my own because it's really just the streaming. When you're live streaming and with the internet connection and anytime anything else like opens or tries to give you an alert or whatever, like there's a potential for a glitch to happen. And that's not fun to watch. Like that's why I'm trying to like recreate all these videos. And I've done this with Minecraft and Borderlands already. Um, talking about variables and objects, and I, it was mostly Java, I think, with Borderlands, but I know I've done Python with Minecraft, 
So anyways, um, and yeah, you can check out those, and I randomly like attack a village and stuff, but anyways, so the, the applicable, applicable problems, we've discussed Sudoku, so let's, let's analyze that a little bit. So like, let's say we're going to tackle Sudoku. So first, we would have to store some variables or, or receive an input of a solution, because it was a solution checker or a validator program. And so I had to check for the three cases of are all one through nine numbers in each subgrid, are all one through nine numbers in each row, in, are all one through nine numbers in each column, and are no two numbers in the same of any of those. That means column, row, and subgrid. So that's also a, um, a problem solving thing if you want to get into Sudoku, is you look for duplicates, like numbers that can't exist, can't coexist, there can only be one, you know, stuff like that. And so, and so when we're writing a program to detect if the solution is correct or if it works, then we got to check those three things. So, okay, so let's look at the first one. So to check each row, that means that you need to be able to access the information that exists in each cell in that row, in row one, which is actually zero-based indexing. So at row zero, you know, what is the value for one through nine? And so you need to receive that input and then check. Be like, does it contain one? Yes. Does it contain two? What does it contain three? Yes. All the way through nine. And then you also want to check if it only contains one. Because so there it could be like, what if you received 10 values, which technically shouldn't be a legitimate entry, but just to code safely, you need to take into that account and make it a scalable solution. So like if it's it needs to be, is it one and only one value for one through nine in this range? And that range is row one. Okay, so you've got row one. Now you need to re repeat that. So put that in a loop eight, to eight more times. And so the loops are the next big concept in programming is, okay, I've written a piece of code. Now I want to do it so many more times. How do I do that? Well, you do it with a for loop. So like four, nine times do this and so then you set a timer like okay we're going to do this how many times have we done this nine times okay cool so we've checked all nine rows so and I'll, again i'll show you and you can see on the the tutorial before we even get to that video mm. there's a tab that shows you python code for how to print out every letter of a, a word or how to loop through and do like so many calculations or print out numbers and count or something like that. Um, just so you can kind of get the understanding of how to write a loop because we, we've defined a, a use case. We want to see if a solution for a Sudoku problem is actually a solution. So now we've checked all of the rows and now we've got all of the rows correct. Then, okay, now let's check all the columns. So now you need to be comfortable with getting the data in each column and only that column. So. Now, and that's usually tricky, like with Java, you got to do like the, the nested for loops, and I guess you would do that still with Python too, sorry, I'm just thinking like, I'm more comfortable doing it, because I did it a lot in Java, but even in Python, so we'd have a nested for loop, where one loop is within a loop, kind of like loopception, and so for every, and it's going to loop through every row, but then it's going to be like, the fifth one in the row, if that makes sense, or actually... Or no, it's still going through each row, but you're only picking the first one and then the second one. And so you need a running timer, a running counter of which uh, piece of data to pull. Yeah, so I think it is still a nested for loop. But anyways, that's something that we'll take a look at. We can figure out. But so then we have to check each column. And then only the column. So you have nine values. You've got to check if there's one and only one, one, one and only one, two, and so on until you get to nine. And then that passes. If that passes, <coughs> then you've validated the second condition of being a, a true solution. Now the subgrid one, so you would almost think that that would work. because, And it does. If you do... The, the circular array one, and I'll show you that one. Well, basically, I can just explain it to you. The solution is the very top left square is 1, then it goes from left to right, 1, 2, 3, all the way to 9, and then the next row starts at 2, ends at 1, so it's 2 through 9, and then back to 1, and then the next one, it starts at 3, ends at 2, and so it goes all the way through 9, then goes 1, 2, and so on, until you've, reached, you've constructed all 9 rows, and it passes those first two conditions because no two numbers exist in the same row, and no two numbers exist in the same column. But 
it clearly like and blatantly violates the <laughs> I think it's like the only condition or like I mean you could offset it a different way so that would actually create a whole group of potential solutions you could do this with so say you uh you start with 9 for the first one and then it goes down or or and if you count backwards as long as it's all uniformly changed you create an entire new set of corner cases that would violate this rule so like kind of like think about trojan horses like sneaking in malicious code like oh you've got this this solution where yeah it, it doesn't violate the first rule or the second rule but oh my gosh it's tap dancing over violating you know again and again and again that rule of like okay well this square has like three threes and two ones and three you know whatever it's like you know it definitely and so that's why you need to target subgrids so now you need to incorporate being able to scan a row and a column simultaneously and get the nine values and now you need to know which how to target you know subdomains basically and so that's why i love this sudoku problem is because that's where and that's the one thing i forgot which is actually the most complex code of the entire program because it's easy to check a row we just did that you know you pull a row that's usually like just you know input line or something and then c plus plus it's like get line or or no i'm mixing that up but anyways what i'm saying is there's built-in functions that will pull the next line in and then you can analyze it and see if there's a one through a nine. Whereas with columns, you have to read through every row and then only select the first, second, or third column, which is also zero based. So at zero zero of a two D array, which is basically you know what we're dealing with, um, yeah, because you got up, down, left, right, two dimensions, like yeah, and so you have an X and a Y. So then you got even that complexity to it. Um, so it's good to at least have a basic understanding of math and like graphs, graphs and stuff, um, which I'm pretty sure was like middle school for me. And so that's why I'm hopeful that like it's probably like, well, still probably middle school. I mean, they, they're going to do the basic math in elementary. I think they're on, let's see, division at a certain, anyways, I'm just trying to think of like what a common standard is to even start learning how to code. But then I say that, but coding is standardized in elementary school now. So I digress, but. Anyways, um, back to the Python solution. So the, how you do that is, is you're targeting 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 2. And then uh, the next one is 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2. And then 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 2. And that is your first grid. And so once you have those mapped out, and you'll say, like, give me the value for those six coordinates. Or wait, no. Nine? Yeah, sorry. The nine coordinates that I just... Uh, yeah, because there's three sets of three. Sorry, I just wanted to double check because without writing it out and seeing it in front of me, it's a little hard to just double check that I haven't forgot something. But anyway, so you got the nine values. That's the first qu or quadrant, or not quadrant, the first uh, subgroup. There you go. Sorry, because a quadrant is like fourths. And anyways, um, <coughs> it's really not important. In fact, there's another snafu solver problem that I want to try to do that's a very similar algorithm. It's just where you're comparing the sides or the edges of a piece of like a six-sided die. Anyways, um, so then you'd have to think, okay, so on a graph from zero zero being the top left to whatever that is, eight eight on the bottom right, and then all of the values in between. And you could you could write out the entire thing on paper, like the entire Sudoku solution, and even like just know that this is. Hey, just write a zero zero at the top left and an eight eight at the bottom right, and then everything in between is just kind of like a sliding scale. So kind of an easy way to visually like think about it. And then, so the next one would be what is that? Zero, three, four five. So then you got zero three four five one three four five, two three four five. So now it's like musical like counting, <laughs> kind of like counting a beat. But anyway, that's why music and arts and stuff is important too. So. Oh shoot, I, I, I did take band a lot, so I should put that on there. So anyway, so now you've got the second um, subgroup. I keep wanting to say quadrant, but it really is like, you have the second section, and then the third section would be still rows zeros, one, rows zero, one, two. So it'd be zero, let's see, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yep, so zero, six, seven, eight, one, six, seven, eight, two, six, seven, eight, and there's your third subgroup. And then you gotta do it again, six more times all right so let's go ahead and do the fourth subgroup that's uh now we're starting at three so it's three four five are the rows and then but it's still zero one two for the first one so it's 
3013142 and then 4041432 is it 012 and 345 yeah 5012 ah jeez anyway see and again it's a lot easier if you're like writing it out um and which we will we will in python and we'll write it out I mean, we can even write it in comments first until it makes sense because we're, we're already running this program testing the rows and the columns and once we have that without any bugs it's not making the program crash or get an error or anything then we can keep playing with this and make it to where it targets these nine subgroups so and actually we basically said that if you were to like work that out with pen and paper you could have like or even just listening to this and writing it down you've already got the first four subgroups Okay, let's think about the middle one. So then it's three, four, five, three, four, five. So it's three, 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 four, three, five, four, three, four, 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 five, five, three, five, four, five, five. See, that just took us for us to understand. But it's because we understood the underlying algorithm. Like, okay, we've already got this set, which is zero through two. And then we've got this second set, which is three, four, five. And it's almost like reciting the alphabet. Whenever you're trying to like alphabetize things, Oh, that's why I love like Magic the Gathering cards. And again, I'll explain why I also, you know, hate a societal problem about that. But in the nerdy, innocent sense, outside of jails and prisons. Um, anyways, uh, Magic the Gathering is great because then you're organizing them between color, um, spell, creature type, and all of these subgroups. And then you're also classifying them alphabetically. And then, you know, and that's even just like organizing them. So, I, you know, anyways, that was a nerdy hobby I had when I was growing up. And... I also liked Pokemon, but not nearly as much because it wasn't as fun to play. Like Magic the Gathering, you're actually like playing with like like damage dealt and like you have 20 lives or 20 hit points. And so it's basically like a video game before we had video games. I mean, we used our imagination and pretended. And it was kind of like Dungeons and Dragons without the commitment. Like that's also a cool thing, but it's also been nerdied. And then you got LARPer where it's like, so for the people that actually want to go out and like try to smack somebody with a real, like not, not a real sword obviously, but like, actually hitting someone with a sword it's like you know then you're really trying to make vr and like in old and you're actually getting more exercise but i don't know it's still you seem silly but yeah we put on a vr headset and then you can be like ronald mcdonald or whatever and nobody bats an eye like you know except for the copyright infringement so you know but i did just send out a meme to the fellows about with ronald and like that's so what i was kind of thinking of it anyways um back to the python actually let's let's see that all right, so that's good. 32 minutes. Let's go ahead and just cut this video here. And, oops. Oh, hey there. Um, so, yeah, let's go. Let's go do the Code Wars thing. This could be really fun. This could be really embarrassing. And, wait, I just noticed I'm, I'm Al Gore 719 on this thing. Interesting. <laughs> All right. Tally ho, I will see you all later. Hope you enjoy and hope you learned something. And hope and let me know if you did. Definitely let me know if you land a job with any of these skills. I mean, it, it, that is the most rewarding thing. Ah, this is the most rewarding thing is knowing that the learner has learned. So, and that's a TWI thing from building wind turbine blades. So, anyways, um, ta ta for now. Ah. I'm trying to say like, wait, is it this emote? Ta-ta for now. And then I got to pick up my thing. All right. See you later. Bye.